Hello, everyone. I'm joining you from London rather than Leipzig, although it's a great pleasure to be part of the email this year, which normally would take place in Leipzig, but for the pandemic. I had the great pleasure of visiting Leipzig several years ago and giving a lecture at the Hochschule, in addition to working with some very talented pianists in a Chopin masterclass later that day. And one of the things that I discussed with the pianists I, I worked with was line, such an important consideration in playing Chopin, and indeed in all sorts of music, line, uh, line at small levels, line at large levels, and so forth. And I found myself often using gestures to explain how the line might unfold, saying the, the phrase could go like this. So you have a, a kind of up and down undulation effect and so forth. That is, in fact, the idea that I'm going to be discussing today with you um, in a lecture called Defining Shape in Musical Performance. This is a topic that I've spent many, many years thinking about, writing about, and making work in my own playing as a pianist. I've been a pianist all my life and have had two trajectories in my career, one academic and one musical, although I've tried very hard and I hope succeeded to bring the two together. There's probably no better image that I could show you in trying to define shape in musical performance than this diagram from Alexander Truslitt, the German writer who uh, in 1938 produced this kinematic interpretation of Brahms's Rhapsody, Opus 79, number two. In this diagram, Truslitt tries to capture the motion inherent in the music. Um, I say inherent in the music, but really it's implied by the score and realized in sound by the performer. That's an important distinction that I'm going to explore later in the lecture, implied by the score and then brought to life by the performer. Another example of some of these curves that have been proposed to capture motion are these movement curves uh, written out by Edward Sievers a few years earlier, 1924. These have to do with the movement inherent in language. You see, as I speak, I'm going up and down, as you can hear, and this is true, of course, in just about every language. The up and down is part of the meaning of the language, just as the up and down is part of the meaning of music. That is the very idea that we're going to explore today with reference to this thing called shape. So I'm going to start with some initial thoughts on shape before proceeding to a section of the lecture on analyzing shape and performance, showing you the work of other people as well as myself in terms of how shape has been analyzed in performance. We'll then try to infer to extract extract shape from the score before I give you a case study of hearing shape based on my work as a member of the jury of the last Chopin competition in 2015. So these initial thoughts, um, well, shape is a notion that is possibly uh, best captured as a single term in, in English with this word shape, but it's not one that translates very easily to other languages. I've never found in any other language that I've encountered a direct counterpart. Um, and yet it's a term that, as we'll see, um, is used over and over and over again by people who do speak English with respect to musical process. And of course, this applies to those who are using other languages. Now, I've already alluded to the movement properties of language and indeed the movement properties of music itself. I thought I would begin with two quotations, which I think capture these qualities. The first is by Carol Pratt, 1931, who said in this pithy statement, music sounds the way emotions feel. There's an awful lot behind this statement. I mean, we often think about music as a very emotional um, art, a kind of emotional journey, if you will. Um, well, why is that the case? Why should we have such strong reactions when we hear and experience music? And Carol Pratt is alluding to this kind of topological, topographical similarity between emotional process and musical process. This is absolutely fascinating and something that we'll talk about as we proceed. Suzanne Langer, some 20 years later, took the idea further in her own words. She said, because the forms of human feeling are much more congruent with musical forms, 
than with the forms of language, music can reveal the nature of feelings with a detail and truth that language cannot approach. There are certain aspects of the so-called inner life, physical or mental, which have formal properties similar to those of music, patterns of motion and rest, of tension and release, of agreement and disagreement, preparation, fulfillment, excitation, sudden change, etc. I find this a very beautiful encapsulation of much of what happens in music and an indication of why music has such a strong effect upon us. As you well know, music can really get to the heart of your very being, the heart of your feeling in a way that nothing else can. And that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about today with respect to this elusive notion of shape. Now, shape is such an important topic that we devoted an entire project to it in the research center that I directed, the uh, Research Center for Musical Performance as Creative Practice, which was based at the University of Cambridge from 2009 to 14, and which had a number of partner institutions, including King's College London, where this project, Shaping Music and Performance, took place under the leadership of Professor Daniel Leach Wilkinson. His colleagues set off with three main questions in mind. First, how do performing musicians use the idea of shape or shaping music? Secondly, which aspects of music generate a sense of shape? And thirdly, what mechanisms underlie the music shape association? To explore these questions, the colleagues used a number of different approaches, including questionnaires interviews, experiments, and so forth. And I'm going to show you some of the results that they came up with. In respect of their online questionnaire study, they asked people to think about shape in relation to music. And they found that this is common, it's frequent but memorable, and it's used in different situations, including practice, rehearsals, teaching, and discussion. They discovered that thinking about shape is appropriate for a wide range of music, it feels natural or instinctive, and it's linked to a range of musical components, including phrasing, melody, a whole piece, and dynamics, along with others. So in short, their conclusions were that musicians' use and understanding of shape vary according to the genres performed, their cultural background, and importantly, the capabilities of their instrument. I remember having interesting discussions with colleagues who play different instruments about how they embody shape. As a pianist, I'm always thinking in terms of a, a lateral geography as much as everything else. Uh, whereas, for instance, a violinist might think about opening in and out, a uh, clarinetist about shape in, in other respects. So the capabilities of an instrument are critical in respect of an understanding and use of shape. The terms that the people in the questionnaire study considered equivalent to shape are just about everything you can think of, anything that can move or have a process in music, including phrase and phrasing, expression, form, feeling, structure, color, direction, movement, contour, flow, dynamics, meaning, line, curve, melody, rhythm, emotion, gesture, intensity pattern, and tension, including patterns of release, and relaxation. This is pretty much everything, and probably we could go further, but these are very, very key points of contact, points of equivalence uh, between this term shape, which obviously has a vast potential meaning, um, and indeed the reality of music as understood by those who are making or hearing music. These colleagues went further and conducted an interview study with violinists and harpsichordists. And among their key findings were the following. First, that musical shaping involves change in multiple expressive parameters. This notion of change is important. When I said earlier that shape was implied by the score, it has to do with the implication of process, of something changing, or if you will, something moving. And so here we have a, a kind of implication of gesture already within the notion of shape. Secondly, musical shaping is sometimes closely linked with personal and musical identity. This dualistic aspect of identity is something I've written about recently in an article called Impersonating Music in Performance, where I said that we achieve our own identity as performers by losing our identity as people 
and gaining an identity with the music we're performing. So shape is part of that. It's not the only thing implicit there, but it's an important part of how we eventually identify with and project music. And the third point that they uh, discovered in their interview study was that musical shaping is closely linked with gesture and movement, as I've already implied and said. Now, I'm going to close this part of the lecture with a quotation from one of the violinists who participated in the study. And this, I think, is an absolutely pithy, fascinating quotation, which I'd like you to think hard about, a quotation which will guide much of what we're going to do in the remaining time. This violinist, Elsie, said, every note should have some kind of shape, and every phrase needs to have a shape. And it all depends on whether the note is important or not, whether the harmony is important or not. Now, there are a couple of really significant things to say in respect to this. I remember back in my Leipzig masterclass in 2017, and in many other masterclasses that I've taught, and in my own playing as well, that I am insisting always on an understanding of every single element of a piece of music. What is its role? What is it doing? Why is it there? Often I encounter in, in younger pianists and sometimes older ones a tendency just to sort of play the notes on the page without thinking about every single one as having a kind of personality, a kind of identity in its own right, a role. Why is it there and what is it doing? And this violinist Elsie has put her finger on it. She says that every note and every phrase need to have a shape. And we could go on beyond that. Every element needs to have a kind of shape or a sense of purpose, a role in the overall process of the music. But the second point I'd like to stress here as we wrap up this first part of the lecture is how did Elsie decide the importance of these notes and phrases, the relative roles of these things. How does anybody do this? It requires a lot of thought at some level. So we'll stop there for a moment, thinking hard about these notions that I've presented because they will serve as the basis of what follows. If we can give every single note, every phrase, every element of our performances some sort of shape, identity, purpose, role, well, that will be at least half the battle won 